Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Indiana Citizens Redistricting Commission virtual public hearing for Indiana's first congressional district. I'm Julia Vaughn, Policy Director for Common Cause Indiana, and I want to thank you for joining us for this important conversation. Just want to briefly give you some information about these, how these hearings are structured. In just a minute, after I finish with these housekeeping announcements, I'm going to introduce you to the chairperson of the Citizens Redistricting Commission. She will tell you a bit about herself and then ask each of the other members to do the same. Once you've met our team, the program will come back to me. I've got a PowerPoint presentation for you to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of understanding the basics of redistricting. Once I'm done, we'll open it up for questions and your testimony. To ask a question or to give testimony, you will use the raise your hand function. Once you are recognized by the chair, you will be unmute, unmuted and can give your uh, testimony or ask your question. We will be asking you to weigh in on a basic redistricting question via the chat box function. And I do wanna mention that we are recording this hearing and it will be publicly available on the coalition website. Thanks again for being with us. And I'm pleased to introduce the chairperson of the Citizens Redistricting Commission, Sonia Learcamp. Hi, my name is Sonia Learcamp and I do often go by Sunny. That is a nickname my mother gave me from birth. So you are welcome to, me, to refer to me as Sunny. Um, I live in Brown County, Indiana, although I was born in LaPorte County and I have also lived uh, part of my life in Johnson County. And the bulk of my life, I lived in Hamilton County. I have three children who were raised and went to school in Indiana, and I have one granddaughter. Um, I decided that I was interested in this particular commission because I know that redistricting is at the core of making sure that the one person, one vote concept is enabled. And so although I am learning a lot about redistricting, um, I felt that this was a level that I was interested enough in to become involved in and to seek public input into that process. So I'm honored to be here with you today. And I would like for you to meet my fellow uh, commission members. Uh, Lee, I'll call on you first to introduce yourself. Well, I'm Lee Morris, I'm from LaPorte, Indiana. And LaPorte County is split between Congressional District 1 and Congressional District 2. So I'm, I'm basically a District 2 representative, but I'm delighted to be a part of today's meeting. And this is such an important uh, process that we're going through because public opinion and public pressure on our legislators is really the key to getting redistricting done on a much more fair and equitable way. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity of being a member of this commission and a part of this public hearing. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, Clara, would you introduce yourself now, please? So I'm Clara Gillespie, and I'm from Indianapolis, and I'm semi-retired, and I'm glad to be a part of the commission. I've been involved in the Urban League, several different social service organizations throughout my last 25 or 30 years, the Richard G. Luger Excellent Public Service Series for Women. So as a part of this commission, I want to make sure that Everything is going to be, which we all are, is going to be right and look at the map, how it's divided. And I was looking at last week, how as a child, when through my lifetime, how each time my district keeps changing. And so it needs to, well, now to change. A few years ago when we moved and bought a house, but I'm saying growing up, the one that I lived in the longest has changed. So we want to make sure that we have fair and, and everybody is well represented today. Thank you so much, Clara. Um, Chip, would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Chip Taylor. I'm a political science professor uh, here in Muncie, Indiana, and I've had a longstanding interest in uh, civic education programs and political participation programs. So uh, very excited to be a part of this project to help educate people about the redistricting process and how it affects them and to find out um, 
how you know, the maps have been drawn in the past have affected them. We've, this is our th the third session we've had and, and some of the, the testimony we, we've heard in the other, the first two districts we heard from has been very eye-opening about how people feel about you know their representation. So excited to hear what people have to say in the first district today. Thank you, Chip. Uh, Marilyn, would you please go next? Yeah, thank you, Sunny. I'm Marilyn Moran Townsend. I'm uh, one of the Republican members of this commission. And uh, I, like my fellow commission members, are just uh, thrilled to be here because we all believe in fairness. Uh, I'm the CEO of CVC Communications in Fort Wayne, which is in the third congressional district. Uh, and I'm past chair of the Indiana Chamber and past chair of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. And I've received public appointments from five governors of both parties. Uh, I care a lot about this issue because four years ago, we created a vow, Advancing Voices of Women. And among other things, we work to get women elected and we teach them how to collaborate across the aisle once they're elected. But what we found was that one of the biggest barriers is the structural problem caused by partisan districting. Thus, uh, I really care a lot about this issue and look forward to what you all have to say. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Xavier, you're next. Absolutely, thank you, Sonia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight. My name is Xavier Ramirez. I'm a current freshman at Indiana University Bloomington studying human resources management and law and public policy. Um, I'm from Carmel, Indiana, and I'm a Democratic chairman. Um, I was really fortunate to, there's a lot of great staff at Indiana University, and one of my professors in law and public affairs guided me towards gerrymandering, and he showed what an important issue it is to be addressing, and he was able to teach me more about it, and after doing a research project for him, he guided me to Julia and the ICRC, and so I am so honored to be here today, and I am eager to hear everyone's testimony. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, Chris, would you go next, please? Thanks, Sonia. Uh, my name is Christopher Harris. Uh, I am from Gary, Indiana. Uh, I currently reside in Hammond, um, Lake County representative uh, here on this panel. I'm so excited to hear from the public, especially from my home congressional district. Um, I got involved with uh, the ICRC because I realized how important it is to have fair representation, uh, especially in the state. Uh, I have a lot of friends uh, who feel like their vote doesn't matter because, you know, Indiana is a red state. So, you know, my vote doesn't count anyway. And I think that that's very dangerous for our democracy, that if people feel that their voices aren't heard, uh, that they just don't participate in the process. Uh, I've been involved in local community organizing uh, efforts in Gary. I got my start with the Central District Organizing Project uh, with Lori Peterson Latham, uh, uh, working to empower people in Gary to uh, you know, take ownership and be involved and understand that they can participate um, in the local community and uh, be involved. So I'm thrilled to be on the panel. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what uh, you have to say. Thank you. And we're glad to have you too, Chris. Uh, Missy, would you like to go next, please? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Sonia. My name is Missy Summers Kemp. I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but I reside currently in Portage, Indiana. This district is very, very dear to my heart. So I'm really, really excited to be able to hear from my friends and my neighbors and for them to tell me how they really, really feel. A lot of them feel like they just aren't spoken to or heard of. So when I heard from the League of Women Voters that they were looking for someone to join the ICRC for redistricting and all this other stuff, I was like, well, I don't know what that means. And I realized that I don't know what it means, neither do they. So my goal here is to bring everything that I've learned and take it back to them so they can start feeling like they are a part and they can realize how important this 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 district is to them and how important it is <laughs> for them to get involved. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Missy. Um, Tom, would you go next, please? Yeah, my name is Tom Hayhurst. I'm a medical doc. I'm uh, obviously I'm not retired and rewired. I supervise a free health clinic over in Columbia City, Indiana. And I'm uh, speaking to you from Allen County. I was on city council in Fort Wayne for three terms. I participated in a redistricting process then, the redistricting of the city of Fort Wayne with its six different councilmanic districts. So I think I have a good uh, 
firsthand understanding of the process. Uh, I always say I'm a, a good government guy and uh, gerrymandering is, 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 is bad government, whether it's done by Republicans in Indiana or Democrats in another state. So I think we need to straighten out this problem nationwide, literally. Um, I'm honored to be on this uh, group and uh, honored to work with this uh, great group of individuals on the, on the ICRC. Thank you, Tom. Ranjan, would you uh, like to introduce yourself now? Sure, thanks, Sonia. I'm Ranjan Rahatki. I live in South Bend, Indiana. Um, I'm a professor of mathematics at St. Mary's College. Um, at the school, I teach a class called Mathematics of Voting, and part of what um, I've studied and I've taught is uh, the mathematics kind of underlying gerrymandering, and that's what got me interested in uh, being on this commission. So I'm very excited to be here and very excited to hear what you all have to say and what you all want your district to look like. Thanks. Thank you, Ranjan. Um, and last but not least, Jack, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Jack Tharp. I'm a resident of uh, Noblesville, Indiana. Uh, I'm a retired administrator from Indiana University. I'm an alternate Republican on the commission. And uh, I uh, uh, applied for this uh, position because I'm concerned about the fairness of redistricting uh, in our uh, state. The current balance really is not what it should be based upon uh, what we see voters across the state. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, I'm now going to um, turn this back over to Julia, who is going to give us uh, kind of a tutorial on what redistricting is all about and the kind of factors that we need to take into consideration. Julia. Thank you, Sean. Sunny, let me see if I can share my screen. Here we go. Okay. All right, well, again, thank you all for being here. Um, as one of the commission members mentioned, this is our third hearing and it's really been informational. So thanks for taking time on a beautiful Saturday afternoon to uh, join us. Who are the, uh, who is the coalition sponsoring this effort? Uh, all in for democracy. We're also known as the Indiana Coalition for Independent Redistricting. And we got started back in 2015, originally uh, Common Cause Indiana, my organization, and the League of Women Voters joined together and recognized that if we were gonna make any progress on redistricting reform, we had to join forces with other organizations. And we were very successful in our outreach. We now number 24 organizations, uh, groups working on environmental issues, uh, women's issues, workers' issues, public education, um, all recognize that gerrymandering presents a structural problem at both the federal and state level. And uh, so we've been working together now for six years. We do grassroots organizing, lobbying, and public education. Uh, back several years ago, we worked very hard and got a bipartisan pro-reform study committee recommendation uh, that in, resulted in uh, legislation being introduced in 2017. Unfortunately, despite a lot of public support, more than 300 people turning out for a committee hearing, an hour and a half of public testimony, all of it in support, one lone individual stood up to testify against the bill, uh, yet the chairman of the committee refused to take a vote. Uh, so we were very disappointed, but we soldiered on in our effort. Uh, there was a criteria bill sponsored by Senator Greg Walker, a Republican from Columbus, Indiana, former chair of the elections committee. Uh, his bill would have put into Indiana law some additional criteria about how districts need to be drawn. Uh, that bill did pass the Indiana Senate two years and unfortunately failed to get a hearing in the House of Representatives. 
So despite all of our years of work and lots of organizing and lots of success educating the public about the importance of redistricting reform, we were not successful passing it through the General Assembly. So we regrouped over the summer and came up with this plan to impact redistricting in 2021, um, despite the lack of, of action by the General Assembly. So the idea that we came up with was the Indiana Citizens Redistricting Commission. And I just recognized I hadn't got <laughs> Uh, this view, sorry about that. Um, and our team is nine members and they were chosen by a subcommittee of the members of the coalition. Uh, the structure is based on the legislation that was introduced on behalf of our coalition by Senator John Ruckel's house. Uh, so it's three Republicans, three Democrats and three people who are neither Republican nor Democrat. We decided after we discovered that this process was going to stretch out months longer than it usually does, that we should probably add some alternates. And so we did that as well. Um, it, this is really similar to an effort back in 2011 that Common Cause Indiana, the League of Women Voters of Indiana and AARP in our state um, conducted back then. I structured a little bit differently. We actually had 11 members back then. We also did not have the mapping competition component uh, that we will uh, this year. But we have some experience certainly uh, running a citizens commission project. My organization did sponsor a mapping competition for local districts uh, in Marion County back in 2012. That was called Draw Marion County. Uh, but the purpose of all of this is to demonstrate that a multi-partisan and diverse group with no direct interest in the outcome will draw back maps that are better for voters and better for communities than maps driven by very self-interested members of the legislature. So for once, time is on our side, as you probably heard, uh, the census uh, ran into a lot of challenges. Um, last year, they were trying to count people during a pandemic. Uh, the Trump administration certainly made every effort to not count certain people in our country. Uh, so the Census Bureau is really digging out from all of that this year. And because of it, uh, their delivery of the census data that states need to draw new districts is going to be very, very late. Uh, the General Assembly by statute has to adjourn by April 29th, and they will not get census data until September 30th. So obviously they won't be drawing maps during the regular session this year. They will have to return sometime this fall, uh, presumably in October, but they've made no announcements as to any potential date yet. But uh, they will have to repeal some current language. Uh, there is in Indiana election law a statute that says if the General Assembly doesn't draw congressional maps by April 29th, a backup commission comes into play and draws the congressional maps. The backup commission is a political commission. It's composed of five members, four members of the legislature, one appointee from the governor's office. Uh, but again, that statute is going to be repealed. The General Assembly has been clear. They want to have full control of redistricting for both their maps and the congressional districts. So we are going to spend these uh, intervening months doing a lot of grassroots organizing, lobbying, uh, community mapping workshops. Um, we're going to spend the time making sure that Hoosiers are fully engaged in redistricting and ready to respond whenever the special session starts. And we are concerned that the General Assembly will try to get in and out. Um, you know, their general uh, MO in terms of special sessions is they don't like them, they try to avoid them. 
Um, and so we don't want to have something where blur uh, redistricting happens and the public doesn't even realize what was going on. So uh, we are determined to make sure the process is transparent and not rushed. There's been a lot of significant redistricting litigation over the years, going back to 1961 and the case that got it all started, and that was Baker versus Carr, uh, where the Supreme Court said that re redistricting is justiciable. It is an issue that uh, you can take to court uh, and um, argue about, essentially. Uh, Reynolds versus Sims was a very important case because it said that state legislative districts uh, have to be relatively equal in population. And of course, the whole idea is to fulfill the constitutional principle of one person, one vote. Uh, unfortunately, from our perspective, recent attempts to have the Supreme Court rule on partisan gerrymandering have been unsuccessful. Uh, very well-known case from Wisconsin, Whitford versus Gill, and then the North Carolina case, Common Cause versus Ruscio. And essentially the Supreme Court just punted on the issue of partisan ger gerrymandering. They said it's a political issue, it's not a legal issue, uh, we are not comfortable weighing in on when partisanship goes too far and when maps are, are, are unfair uh, to the minority party. They lamented that gerrymandering is a bad thing, destructive for democracy, uh, but they said if citizens are unhappy with the districts, their only recourse are state courts or to pass reform. Uh, through their legislature or through ballot measures. As we know here in Indiana, uh, passing reform through the legislature is a lot more difficult than passing reform through ballot measures. In fact, a couple of our state, uh, neighboring states, uh, Michigan and Ohio, will have very different redistricting processes this year thanks to ballot initiatives that were passed in those states. Unfortunately, that is not an avenue that's open to us here in Indiana. So again, uh, it is potentially um, uh, possible to uh, challenge uh, these maps in state court uh, for partisan gerrymandering, though it is important to remember that racial gerrymandering litigation is still viable at the federal level. So just, you know, why do we engage in this exercise every 10 years? As I, I hinted at in the previous slide, the whole idea, uh, and of course the timing is significant. We do this after the federal census when we know how many people are in the United States, how many people in Indiana. Uh, we do this uh, so that we can equalize the population in all our districts. Of course, the problem is that this task falls to exactly the wrong group of people, those who are most self-interested and it allows politicians to choose their voters rather than voting voters choosing their politicians. Uh, another problem is there are very few guidelines uh, and so it's quite easy for partisanship to take over. Uh, when there's, there's not too many guardrails to keep people going straight down uh, the road. Now, let's be clear that while in 2011 in Indiana, Republicans controlled everything and, and are responsible for the maps that are in place now, uh, certainly Democrats have been capable of gerrymandering as well. Um, do it in those states where they dominate. And, and when, we're pro when Democrats had the opportunity here in Indiana, uh, certainly they took the opportunity too. So there are, there are no, innocent, um, no innocence when it comes to gerrymandering. And then sort of the third level of the, of the stool is transparency. Uh, it's important that the public understand uh, how these maps were drawn. And so what data did you use? Obviously, census data is, is the basic building block, but typically there are other layers of data. Uh, for example, political 
uh, data, election results, um, demographic data. Uh, certainly things like race are important to take into account because you've got to make sure you're not running afoul of the Voting Rights Act. So we want to understand what data the General Assembly will be using. We're going to be entirely transparent about the data we use in our map drawing process. And we're also interested if consultants will be used because it's certainly not unusual, uh, particularly when congressional districts um, are, are uh, when they're working on those for outside consultants to be brought in. So we'd like to know if that's the case, if there are people uh, being hired uh, to help with the redrawing of our maps. And then we also would hope that the public would be given the same access to this data and given the opportunity to draw their own versions of maps. So when you talk about reforming redistricting, it's important to really think about who and how. Uh, who's in charge of the redistricting process? Again, uh, we believe the current process in Indiana amounts to a very significant conflict of interest when uh, the Indiana House, Indiana Senate draws their own maps and the maps for our congressional delegation. Now, when we talk about an independent commission, uh, we don't mean an apolitical group of people. That's been one of the criticisms that um, the, our opponents in the General Assembly have leveled that it would be impossible to gather a group of nonpartisans. And obviously that's not we, what we seek to do when our folks introduce themselves to you. Uh, they mentioned partisan affiliation. So the problem isn't that, um, you know, uh, we want to take politics out of redistricting. What we want is a balance. We want multipartisanship and a group of people that really look like and are representative of voters in our state. So the who piece is, is extremely important. And I think it, the only way to build trust among the public is to have a multipartisan group of people in charge of redistricting. But it's also important to think about how uh, the redistricting has to be done. Now, there are just, as I said earlier, a handful of, of mandatory criteria. The first, obviously, is equal population, the reason why we do this in the first place. The second mandatory criteria is respect for the Voting Rights Act. You've got to make sure that you're not drawing districts that will negatively impact the political power of minority groups in the district. Uh, Indiana has an additional criteria of contiguity. Maps have to be connected at all points, but that's it in terms of statutory guidance. And we think there are some other things that need to be considered. So additional criteria that we will be considering as our group seeks to draw maps that are representative of voters and good for communities are three basic things. Uh, first is incumbent blind. Should we worry about where the incumbent legislators, incumbent Congress people live and draw the maps around them? Or should we not worry about that and just draw the districts? And if they end up outside their district or in a district with another incumbent, then that'll work itself out electorally. Uh, but it's not something that we need to worry about. So the, the first sort of optional criteria is incumbent blind. A second optional criteria is compactness. Uh, there are very good and laudable things that can come about when you have a district that is geographically compact. Um, it can be easier for the elected official to get around the district, fully represent. Uh, it can be less confusing if people, um, a constituents are in a compact a geographic area, a little way for them to be confused about how uh, who their representatives are. So compactness, important criteria to consider. And then there's competitiveness. Should we seek to draw districts that are relatively equal in terms of the major political parties, Republican and Democrat, 
uh, because certainly when districts are competitive, um, it's easier to hold elected officials accountable. They tend to uh, respond to their voters. Uh, so, you know, is competitiveness something that we want to encourage uh, as we look to draw new districts? And there is definitely a tension between compactness and competitive because often the more tightly compact districts are, uh, the more like-minded people you are, are putting into one district. And so that can negatively impact the competitiveness of a district. So, you know, it is important uh, to rank criteria. And that's what we're going to ask you to do in the chat box. Think about of these three optional criteria, which do you think should come first, which could, should come second, and which should come third, because depending on how you prioritize these criteria, you can come up with very, very different districts. Um, and as I mentioned, transparency is also an important consideration in the how piece of redistricting. Important to understand all of the data used, what criteria was prioritized, was compactness prioritized over competition or vice versa. Um, and we also think it would be very helpful if the legislature would provide a physical description of proposed districts. Uh, when the legislation comes out, districts are listed by precinct. And most of us, you know, don't recognize where we live by precinct. And so we think it would be helpful if they would describe the political subdivisions, uh, you know, this part of Lake County, these townships in Lake County uh, certainly would be easier for uh, lay people and citizens to understand what is being proposed for their districts. Uh, we also want to see full opportunities for public participation. The General Assembly traditionally has done a lot of public meetings before districts are drawn, gone out around the state. That's a good thing. But they have not tended to do that after they come up with drafts to go back and get feedback from people. And in fact, traditionally, if you wanted to take part in that conversation, you've had to travel to the State House in Indianapolis. And so um, we want them to do a better job in terms of really actively seeking uh, public comment and, and what the public thinks both before and after. And then lastly, we think that the public should have access to uh, web-based mapping tools so that if they choose to uh, come up with their own versions of maps, they can do so in the convenience of their own home, submit those to the General Assembly for consideration. I do want to take just a slide to talk a little bit more detailed about uh, racial gerrymandering in the Voting Rights Act, because it is a very important consideration as we start considering new districts. And as I said earlier, unlike partisan gerrymandering, the Supreme Court, well, not this current Supreme Court, but in the past, the Supreme Court has taken a stand against racial gerrymandering. There are numerous uh, cases. And basically redistricting may not be used to dilute the strength, the voting strength of minority groups. Uh, that can be done in a, in a variety of ways. Packing is, as I mentioned earlier, packing a bunch of minority voters into one district so that they're uh, voting power is restricted to that district, uh, packing. Cracking is the opposite of packing, as you might infer, uh, when a minority uh, group of voters would be sectioned off and assigned to a variety of different districts so they don't make up critical mass in any district, can't really uh, be a significant political force. Tacking is when you would tack a uh, minority neighborhood uh, sort of randomly into a, a majority district, uh, again, to dilute their political power. And when this is done according to race, another term that is sometimes used is bleaching. When you seek to 
um, dilute the effect of black or brown voters. It has a bleaching impact on maps. Now, um, when you're looking in terms of proving a racial gerrymander, race is not the only factor. It's not, you know, if you get a, a certain threshold of minority voters, it obviously triggers the Voting Rights Act. You have to draw maps uh, that are majority minority. Uh, there's a two-part test, and so it's not just the number of minority, the percentage of minority voters. They also have to function as a voting block. So it's a two-part test to prove uh, racial gerrymandering. And in 2011, uh, some folks, there was quite a bit of talk about the Marion County Senate maps and how they are drawn to extend out into some of the suburban and rural districts surrounding Marion County and had the impact of diluting the black vote in Marion County. It was frankly surprising to me that um, uh, litigation wasn't filed in that case. Let's talk just, as I said, a little bit more detailed about criteria because we are gonna be asking you to weigh in on this. Obviously, the most important one again in a statutory criteria is equal population. Congressional districts have to be uh, nearly as equal as possible. And our current ones are very equal in population, just one or two individuals off. So um, very, very close. You're allowed to have more variation in the population for your state legislative districts, uh, usually to be justified for some good reason. Um, but uh, in Indiana, the General Assembly has not allowed much variation at all uh, in the legislative districts, uh, less than uh, 2% here. Also uh, required under federal and state law, districts must be in compliance with the Voting Rights Act, as I just went over previous slide. Indiana has the additional criteria of contiguity. But again, the optional uh, things that we'd like you to think about and that we're thinking very hard about are should maps be drawn incumbent blind? Should they be drawn to emphasize compact geographic districts? Or should they be drawn with an emphasis on drawing districts to be competitive? And let me emphasize that it would be impossible to draw 159 districts, the total number of districts that will be drawn this year in Indiana um, that are all competitive, that are all wonderfully compact. Um, you know, these are ideals that we're working towards. And again, it's important that we prioritize one over the other in terms of the optional ones, uh, because you certainly can't draw every district to be uh, compact and competitive as well. So it's, it's a trade-off. And again, emphasizing uh, one of these criteria over the other will result in maps that, that look different, that treat voters different, that treat communities different. Do wanna dive into communities of interest a little bit because we're very interested in your feedback and, and information about com important communities of interest in the first congressional district. Uh, community interest is a group of people concentrated in a geographic area who share similar interests, concerns, priorities. Now, some of these are obviously obvious, easy to pick out on a map, cities, towns, townships, school districts, but others aren't so obvious. Uh, you know, in some parts of our state, the Amish are important communities of interest. So um, important to keep in mind where they're located. Uh, minority neighborhoods, obviously uh, in like county, very diverse. It's important that we understand where those important communities are. And then also, you know, in, in Indiana, uh, we are a state where certain industries can be very important regionally. Uh, for example, the steel mills up in Northwest Indiana, uh, across central Indiana, the auto industry, uh, Kosciuszko County, the biomedical industry. And, you know, those, those industries drive different things in their communities. 
Um, so, so we think those are important communities of interest. So we want to hear from you. Um, how should communities in the first congressional district be treated for purposes of redistricting? Are there uh, areas that it's important to keep intact, to keep whole, or are there places where there should be split? You know, should Michigan City and LaPorte be in the same congressional district or should they not be in the same congressional district? Got just a little case study and this is from Marion County. So I apologize. I know it's a long way from uh, the, por the part of the state that we're uh, focused on today, but it is a really good example of, of what I mean by communities of interest and I hope it better illustrates it for you. Uh, this is Senate District 28. And as you can see, it's a fairly regularly shaped district until you get to this weird little appendage over here. Uh, this is central Indiana. As you can see, um, Indianapolis is, is on the uh, east side here. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, on the west side here. Uh, this is Hancock County and this is Shelby County down here. But this is Marion County, Indianapolis. So you've got uh, a rural area and then city right here, urban. So this is the western part, again, the, the Indianapolis, Marion County. Uh, hopefully you can tell from this side, it's a very typical urban landscape, very densely populated neighborhoods. Uh, got the interstate running through here. Here's US 40, which is of course a major, the um, uh, north-south divider here in Marion County. So this is a very urban part of the district. Now, this is the uh, Shelby County. So this would be the southeast part of the district. And it's very different, as you can tell, uh, just a very different landscape, uh, very rural area uh, in comparison to the western part. And the constituents in this district are very different on the west side versus the east side. This is Warren Township, Indianapolis. Uh, grab this from the Warren Township High School uh, website. A uh, very diverse student body there in Warren Township. Uh, on Morristown Middle School, um, not a very diverse student body, um, very um, entirely a white student body there in Morristown. So again, very, very different constituencies, very different communities, all part of Senate District 28. And this is Senator Mike Kreider, uh, the guy who represents Senate District 28. He lives in Greenfield, which is Hancock County, a very small town, uh, the rural part of the district, yet about half, more than half of his constituents live in the urban part of the district, the Indianapolis part of the district. Um, so far this year, Senator Kreider has voted against mass transit in Indianapolis, uh, which many of his constituents depend on. And he really does have a very tough job representing a district that really has clashing communities of interest. And we heard from some of his constituents during our first hearing uh, that they really feel that their voice is not heard in the process. And so um, there are numerous examples of districts in our state that really do have some communities of interest that aren't compatible. I uh, wanted to include just um, some graphics about how our communities, uh, or how the congressional districts have changed over the years. Uh, certainly some of this has to do with the shift of population. You'll notice that uh, the first congressional district has really gotten stretched out over the years. Uh, certainly population uh, loss and demographic shifts have impacted the compactness of the district. And, but, you know, Lake County is one of the most diverse uh, counties in the state. It's a very diverse region. I think one of the major considerations about the current districts is, is that diversity fully represented and will it be represented in the future? 
So we're interested in what you think. Uh, we'd like you to weigh in via chat and rank that criteria that I talked about, incumbent blind versus compactness uh, versus competitiveness. And we're also very interested in hearing about the important communities of interest in the first congressional district, how they should be treated for purposes of redistricting. The point of all of this is we're going to compile this public testimony, uh, fill out those themes that we hear over and over again that will help guide our public mapping competition. And we're gonna give your testimony to the Indiana General Assembly and ask them to heed it as they start their redistricting process later this fall. We understand this can be a lot to process uh, in just a short amount of time. So if you need time to think and, and weigh it all in your mind, you are certainly welcome to email your testimony to admin at allinfordemocracy.org. You can even write us a letter and send it to the PO box in Indianapolis. And I do hope that you all will um, try tinkering around with map drawing at our website, which is Indiana Districter. Uh, it's not loaded obviously with current census data yet, but uh, it has the 2010 data. So you can play around with it, get familiar with the mapping software. And we hope that you will uh, participate by drawing some maps and submitting them for our competition later this year. So again, thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. And we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. I almost forgot to unmute. Uh, Julia, thank you so much for that tutorial and uh, giving everyone a heads up on uh, the different criteria that we are inviting testimony on today. I do want to advise everyone that if you wish to give testimony, please push the uh, raising hand icon that's at the bottom of the screen and I will call on those individuals um, in the order that they appear. I do want to let you know that um, since we only have um, a total of two hours and we do have um, quite a few participants, uh, we try to limit the comments as best possible to about five minutes. Um, I'm not um, a total dictator about that, but uh, that's just a guideline for you. Um, in addition to that, to start off, I think one of our panelists, Chris, who is from this district, uh, has examined some of the um, issues and numbers uh, that are in this district and may have some, uh, and Missy as well. So I'm gonna call on Chris first and uh, to give us some insight on his thoughts into this process, but please be raising your hand to be ready to speak when he and Missy are finished. Thank you. Uh, Chris, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I guess in this conversation, uh, to kind of frame our mind about our district, uh, Congressional District 1, uh, we need to think about population. Um, so it, uh, the latest census figures or estimates uh, appear that we have lost additional population um, between 2010 and 2020. Now, it seems like um, in recent years, in the maybe in the last two years, maybe that uh, population decline has uh, slowed down a bit, uh, but overall in the decade itself, uh, it appears that we might have lost population um, in Congressional District 1. And as Julia had shared earlier, uh, when you look at Congressional District 1 over time uh, from 1980 to today, um, it's continuously grown. Um, I think uh, between 2000 and 2010, it did shrink a bit uh, to just uh, Lake County, Porter County, and uh, a sliver of LaPorte County, uh, including Michigan City, and uh, let's see here, uh, New Durham, Cool Spring, and Cass, and Clinton Townships. Um, so, so now revisiting that understanding that we could possibly lose additional population um, in, in the next census, um, where do we think is a fair, what do we think is a fair boundary for us uh, Congressional District 1, you know, would that be, you know, incorporating Newton and Jasper counties again, um, like our maps did in the year 2000. Um, and then also for our uh, House and Senate districts, you know, are our maps, you know, fairly represented, you know, to give 
uh, you know, minority populations a voice. Um, and also just considering the demographic shifts within Lake County itself. So I'm from Lake County, I'm from Hammond. Um, but, you know, you also understand that, you know, North Township, Calumet Township, uh, Hobart Township, you know, we're poised to possibly lose population in the 2020 census. Uh, but, you know, our uh, middle and southern uh, townships, uh, such as Hanover Center, uh, West Creek, Cedar Creek, uh, Winfield, uh, are poised to gain population. So, you know, would it be fair for our uh, House and uh, Senate districts to, you know, expand, you know, further southward? Or, you know, would, you know, our House and Senate districts, would it make sense for us to, you know, you know, expand uh, horizontally from east to west um, to make sure that Hammond, East Chicago, Whiting, Gary, uh, Lake Station have a strong voice. Um, so again, you know, this is all organic conversation. We want uh, everyone to, you know, think about, you know, the context of, of that and in our population, uh, our, the, where we stand with our current population. I mean, our hopes is that, I mean, I'm crossing my fingers, believe me, that we've gained population enough in the last two years to, you know, stabilize. But in the event that we don't and we lose population, uh, what would be the best balanced voice for our congressional district um, in our unique corner of the state? Chris, thank you very much. Um, Missy, would you like to weigh in on this as well? Yeah, just to piggyback off of a few things that Chris said, a lot of the people that I've spoken with locally are really concerned about how this map is going to affect them. They already feel like because they're in the surrounding counties that the largest focus is on Gary and Hammond and East Chicago. And they already feel like that they're going to be swallowed up Oh, we lost your voice. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, there must be something wrong with your audio, Missy. Okay, okay, never mind. We're good. There, there you are. Okay, yeah. Um, as I was saying, like they're concerned that they're going to be swallowed up and just included in Lake County and they're they're afraid that they're going to disappear. Um, Hammond, East Chicago, Whiting, they, they're afraid that the population is just going to greatly surpass them. So that's the pulse that I'm getting from them. Okay. Yeah. Missy, thank you very much um, for weighing in on both of those questions. Um, I do want to let the audience know that so far I have three hands. So I'll be calling on those individuals, but be sure to, to um, push your, raise your hand if who do want to make some comments when these three are done. Uh, the first one I'll call on is Telethia. Did I say that correctly? Uh, yes, yes you did. Can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you so much. Okay, great. I, you know, I'm starting to uh, learn more about gerrymandering and districting. Um, I, I, I'm new to Gary. I'm from Gary, but I've been gone for almost 20 years. And so anyway, trying to learn all this, the counties and districts is something new for me, but local control, education. Right now, we in the city of Gary don't have local control. And I was told that it has something to do with uh, the district and how it's the mapping out and the voting in the in Indianapolis. Can you explain what can be done for us to gain local control and, you know, how it relates to gerrymandering and the districts? Thank you. Um, okay, that is um, a really tough question. Um, and uh, Julia, would you like to answer to Lethia? Sure. Um, you know, you're not alone because folks down here in Marion County, we feel the same way. There has been a number of, you know, bills this year targeted at Marion County undoing some of the things that our you know, local city county government has put in place. Uh, I know that over the years, there's also been legislation directed at, at Northwest Indiana as well. And I think it, you know, it does go back to gerrymandering and the very uneven balance of power 
that we have in the Indiana General Assembly. You know, both Lake and Marion County are controlled at the local level by Democrats. Um, our General Assembly and all the state offices in Indianapolis are controlled by Republicans. And so sometimes, you know, they like to show um, that they're the folks who have the power. And despite, you know, most conservatives professing great love and respect for local control, um, sometimes when, again, it, it's the opposing party that wields that local control, um, the state moves in to squash it. So I think the solution is more even representation inside the Indiana State House. Um, we don't believe that super majorities are really representative of Indiana. Uh, we had a discussion at our meeting on Wednesday night about proportional representation. Uh, that's the idea that districts should not exactly, but almost, you know, be in relation to uh, the division of districts should match. Uh, the statewide vote totals, you know, if Republicans get 52% of the vote, then they would be allotted 52% of the seats in the legislative body. So uh, I, I think it's about who wields power, who has absolute power in the state house. And unfortunately, sometimes they um, use it to to prevent local government from uh, doing certain things. So I think Lake and Marion County, um, I know Allen County, I think occasionally has had some trouble with the state legislature. So we just need more even representation. Yes, unfortunately, um, Telethia, there's uh, a concept called home rule that exists only in theory in Indiana right now with the supermajority that the Republican Party has. So the grassroots efforts of these kinds of forums and having the citizenry participate in the redistricting process that elects our legislators is crucial to getting back that power into the hands of the people. So thank you so much for participating. Um, next, I will call on Kevin Kempf. Kevin, are you there? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Kempf. Um, I'm originally from northern Wisconsin. Um, I have moved into Portage, Indiana, um, approximately six years ago. Um, and I've noticed in the past six years, just Portage itself, um, compared to when I first moved here, it seemed we had more diversity compared to what we're going through now. It, it's like, I don't know where that change happened, but I know, you know, something has gone on within the whole state. You can just see that to where our, you know, we're no longer bonding together as one. I mean, with this whole gerrymandering and, you know, Democrats versus Republicans, I know they're both guilty of it. I mean, there's not a politician out there that doesn't want to get a bigger chunk. And then hopefully with the committee and the map you guys choose and pick and, and go with, we'll hopefully, you know, start showing the, the diversity that we need back into this state. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, your, your comments are right on. Um, we hope that you will make sure and uh, enter into the chat room what your priorities are for us to focus on for our redistricting process. And please stay involved and um, also lobby your representatives uh, for this kind of process. So thank you very much though for your comments. Did you have any other comments or questions today? Uh, not, not as of right now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would now call on Rob. Rob, are you there? I think I am now, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, so I'm Rob Albrick Mellinger and I live in the town of Porter. And I'm also a transplant from Milwaukee. So I say hey to Missy and to Kevin and go Wisconsin. Um, I think Christopher did a really good job of saying, um, highlighting what's really going on on the ground here and the concerns that everybody has. 
And I take nothing away from the breadth of what Christopher said, but my primary focus is on the House districting, the federal process. Not that the rest of it is important, it's a close priority number two, but priority number one, and that is because I believe we are paying a huge penalty for the toxicity of the primary process and what that does in our non-competitive district. So for me, competitiveness is number one. And I say that because as Christopher pointed out, Indiana one and, and all the other sub-districts are gonna have to go someplace. <laughs> They're gonna go south. All the other goals notwithstanding, however important competitiveness and everything else is, Indiana one will become more competitive as a result, which is fine as long as the rest of the state also makes competitiveness a criteria. And I don't think, uh, it, I would like to see in Indiana, two years from now, four, six, eight, it's okay that we are still mostly represented by Republicans, but I would like it to see represented by Democrats and Republicans who have to fight a little harder to please more people across their districts, not just in Indiana one, but in all of them. And that's why I say for to me, competitiveness is the most important one. One more thing, thanks to all of you folks on the commission for putting time into this. Your efforts are appreciated, thank you. Well, Rob, thank you very much for that. Um, but obviously the thing that makes it most important is that people like you that take the time to uh, give us that kind of very meaningful input into this process. So thank you so much for taking the time to participate today and give us uh, your testimony. Um, next, I would call on Kendra Johnson. Kendra, are you there? I am, can you hear me? We can certainly hear you now, thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for putting this together. Um, my biggest concern, uh, I'm from Gary, and as it was stated, um, you know, it seems that our, well, our city was damaged a, a great bit due to first um, uh, 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 racial situation. When we elected one particular person mayor, everybody decided they wanted to leave the city. And they went down to Indianapolis to have the bumper removed from Gary and created another town with that bumper. So, and then the recession affected our steel mill industry. And when that happened in the eighties, we lost a lot of people. So, you know, my concern is if, if other districts are, or other areas are absorbed into the first district, um, what kind of representation will we really have? Because we want to have congressional people and we want to have people that not just reflect the city they came from, but the entire area. You know, we would right. want somebody, if somebody's from an urban city that gets elected, we'd also want them to be concerned about the ag uh, agricultural area or we'd want them to be concerned about the steel or manufacturing or whatever area so everyone would get a fair representation as well as being fairly represented downstate which is one of our other biggest problems downstate we're not you know as uh talithia mentioned earlier um, a law was made concerning our school corporation that when another school corporation was also taken over they were given they were given uh certain privileges that our corporation wasn't given so that's my biggest concern you know how other than being an activist what um you know what i'm trying to do matter of fact to the point i'm in indianapolis now trying to make sure that gary is represented when it comes to certain hearings but you know what can we what can we do the most when it comes to making sure that our area 
is not uh, gypped or left out of the process. Well, Kendra, you know, obviously you're very active. And so we feel very privileged to have your input. And I think Chris would actually like to, to address some of the things you've mentioned. Um, Chris. Hey, Kendra. <laughs> I'm glad you made it, glad you made it on. Um, so I think the one thing that we probably should consider that you brought up, you know, um, in your in your point there is that, you know, if our population, you know, is declining, it seems like right now, like for on the local level for the Senate district, I'll use the Senate districts in, in Lake County, for example, it seems like, you know, over time, like our Senate districts are snaking farther and farther to the south in Lake County, you know, so, you know, you might have Gary, you know, split up, you know, between uh, um, Senate District 2 and 3. And then with Senate District 2 and 3, you know, lately it's just been snaking further and further south, you know, into Lake County. So, you know, you know, to your point, like, you know, we, we prefer to maybe instead of, you know, snaking further south, you know, in order to maintain our voice in Gary, Chicago and Hammond, that, you know, maybe we go, you know, horizontal, you know, east to west, you know, so that we can maintain that voice and not feel like, you know, the city of Gary, you know, is being diluted because, you know, our districts are being drawn further away from the city. Okay, Kendra, does that help answer some of your questions or give you some additional input? Um, Thank you, um, because there were a few other people that wanted to get on the call, but they had problems trying to join. Um, and I kind of hope Sorry. you all have another one uh, coming up because I had three people and they tried to, um, I sent it on Facebook, they couldn't get in that way. I sent it by email, they were having problems, but I wanted, um, you know, they wanted to also let their voices be heard. And since they know how much of an activist I am, they were like, well, make sure they know that we had problems trying to get on. So. Okay, we, um, we actually have a tech person on who sets up our meetings for us. So I'm sure she's making note of that. And I will tell you that we have six more of these uh, forums that we are holding so, and you don't have to attend the one just for your district. So we uh, welcome them to try to get on one of those other meetings and make their voices heard. Wait, so, hold on, hold on, hold on, just a minute. Sure. Rachel? Yeah, I'm on. You're on? Sorry. Okay, okay. That was one of the young ladies right there. She was calling me to let me know she finally got on. So is that Rachel? That's why I said, hold on a minute, because if, if she hadn't got on, I would have put her via phone <laughs> on so you all could hurt, hear her. But uh, that's the type of activist I am. I try to, you know, find ways so the people's voices can be heard. Oh, we, we appreciate that so much. And uh, I think Rachel even has her hand up. So I will be getting <laughs> to her. Okay. All right. Hey, thank you again, Kendra. And for thank you all too for doing this and make sure that it's, it's sent in my email, the other ones so that I can get them out to as many people as I can. All right, that sounds great. Um, I will next be calling on Barbara Bowling Williams. Uh, Barbara, Barbara, are you there? I am here, can you hear me? We can certainly hear you, yes. Yay. Okay. I first want to um, thank the commission for volunteering your time um, doing this, going around the state. Hi, Ms. Missy. Uh, going around the state and um, listening to the citizens of, um, of the state of Indiana. Uh, something that, uh, unfortunately, our current General Assembly doesn't seem to have you know, much interest in doing. Uh, but it but redistricting is so crucial and it was never more evident than it was on February the 18th when that um, disruption ha happened down at the, um, the house. And so that right there should show how even our voices are attempting to be silenced because um, with the supermajority um, in the state house, the Republican party does not have to um, 
listen to any, well, they have, they don't have to depend upon any Democrat for a vote to pass anything that they want to. And they do um, pass anything that they want to. But the one thing that they don't have a right to do, and that is to silence us. We absolutely have a right to speak. We elected people to go to that state house to represent and to be our voice at that state house. And when one party tries to usurp that um, right uh, to be heard, then you know, then this whole situation is um, is turned upside down. So again, I've, I'm commending um, the commissioners for being out here because you're going to tell our tale. You're going to be the ones who say to um, to the to this to the legislature, look, you're not interested in wanting to know what the what the people are saying out there, but we have done that. We're bringing it to you. Now the ball is in your court. It's up to you as to what you do with it. But, um, you know, but, but, but it has not been, what happened in, um, on February the 18th is not over. Um, we're having a, you know, NAACP is having a legislative day and everybody's, you know, welcome to come um, to, to voice your, um, your opinions on what happened, but we haven't even gotten an apology for the representatives who were most impacted. So I'm not going to say any more. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all of the people who are on this call. And again, um, just as uh, Sonia, you reiterated that they don't just have to attend this session, you know, if they, for whatever reason, missed out on this session, and we know how technology is, um, that they can go to one of the others that's going to take place. So thank you again, and um, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much, Barbara. I really appreciate your enthusiasm for what we're doing. And um, I know that you sound like the kind of person that is going to get out to your circle of influence and make sure other people get to those forums and voice their positions and their testimony as well. Thank you. Um, I would next call on Rachel Wilborn. Rachel, are you there? Can you hear me? I sure can. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for um, allowing us again, having the privilege to say something, having the chance to say something. Uh, when I sit here and I listen to everything, which I agree with Mr. Harris, I agree with Ms. Johnson, um, Ms. Vaughn and everything, but a couple of things I think of in terms of this redistricting is timing. Because for number one, now me being a middle-aged person, I can see that possibly even in the near future that things in gear, it could get better. I believe it's gonna get better. But from a young person's standpoint, when they look at Gary now, because you understand when they broke up the city, they didn't stop there. They have taken out all kinds of services. Uh, when a young person look at this city, they don't see a skating rink. They don't see a movie theater. They don't see too much of anything, okay? So these people that could potentially be part of our population, it's not, because you know what they do when they get out of high school? Usually, what do they do? They leave. So this redistricting is going on at a time where is people are leaving. And it's more so the younger people. Because why? Because they're here and they don't see anything too much that they're interested in staying for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they, the don't, thing, they don't feel like they count, in other yeah. words. Yeah. Not only that, not only that is... If you were 19 or 20 years old, would you want to stay in a place that didn't have any place for you to really go to? You know, I mean, we got to consider that too. So like I said, this is happening at a time where people, the younger people really are not interested in, in staying here because they don't see too much of a reason. Uh, and the other thing is, I look at all the stuff that's happened to this city, okay? I've been here, I was raised here. I went away for a little bit, but I've came back, I've been back a while. And like I said, I look at what has happened to this city. So the next, I guess the next question would be, what, not only how would this redistricting affect us? Cause like I said, usually the young people leave and this is who you need to stay in the city. Okay, so yeah. how would that really, 
you know, how would that really affect us? And then the next thing is, how is it going to stick? I right. mean, if we go through this, this redistricting thing, how's, how's this going to stick? How, what's going to stop um, um, the cities or whatever from coming forward or people come forward, get together and say, well, now we want to be a city, you know? And then, Rachel, so I, I just, yeah, I, I can really hear the frustration in your voice and we really do understand. And the only way anything's going to stick is number one, to get participation at this level, uh, but to make sure that the legislature hears that they're not gonna get reelected if they don't start responding to some of these concerns. And so uh, I do think that Missy wanted to um, address some of what you've been saying as well. So Missy, would you like to, to talk with Rachel a little bit? Okay, can you hear me guys? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, hi Rachel. Um, one thing that I saw that was really, really promising this election was the youth that were getting out to vote. Um, the most important thing that you can do is to encourage them to make their voice heard, get their friends involved and let them know that they count. I share your frustration. I hear from my peer group as well, how they feel like they're just completely ignored. They're more worried about how they're going to get to school or how they're going to get to work or take care of their kids. And I graduated from IUN. I know IUN is a commuter college, so they don't have on-campus living. So a lot of the people just come in and out. And the most important thing that we need to get them to remember is that take care of home first make sure that they're getting involved in local groups and local okay. political movements behind whatever candidate they choose if it's for if you're for this person get involved with their campaign talk to them see where their policies lie and align yourself with those leaders so that way they feel more like they're a part of their community the best thing that we can keep reminding our youth and our young people is that they have to speak up to feel heard and I understand that they're so frustrated with that and educate them. A lot of them don't know what their vote does. They think it's just a one day thing that they can't get off of work for and their vote is so, so critical. A lot of them don't even understand what they vote for, why they do it, or even how to register. So encourage them to, as soon as they turn 17, go get it done. That's the best thing that I can tell you. And the next thing, just one last thing, when these cities separated, from Gary, you know, what they did, they not only said, well, I want to be another city, they took some of the land. Of course, when they took some of the city with them, they took some of the potential for that city to produce revenue, tax revenue. Okay, so how they need to, so clearly they need to pay us back, pay this city back for taking our land. For them sitting up, okay, I want to be this city, I want to be this city, they're supposed to pay us for that, okay? For to okay. breaking up, like breaking the city up like that, which they haven't done, okay? So okay. how is the redistricting going to affect that? Because that needs to happen. You know, well, and Rachel, the answer to all of these things is trying to make sure that um, we get fair districts and that you get representatives that will hear your voice, hear your concerns and respond to those and not just respond to um, to interests that resonate with them. They have to resonate with all of their um, constituents. So I'm sorry, I'm going to need to cut you off now. Um, and move to our next um, person involved in the forum, but I do thank you. And I would now call on Robert Cotton. Robert, are you there? Okay. Hi. Yeah, my name is Robert Cotton. Hello, Julia Vaughn, how are you? Um, I'm an outlier in the first district, but, and again, we've been uh, in the first congressional district forever. Um, uh, and again, like I say, I, um, I've had as much trouble with the idea of uh, it being perennially uh, democratic by no, with no question as it relates to our congressional representation. Um, well, maybe that had something to do with Pete, uh, but it seems so even the new guy, um, it, it was, it, there was no, no question as to what, what our representation would be. With regard to my overarching problem, and there are a couple factors that impede on that, um, is the ability for um, the the elected official to, to 
to choose its people, so to speak. The, 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 the guy who's running the election, he gets to choose kind of uh, who he's representing as opposed to us choosing him. So competitiveness is very important, but we have a really strange series of dynamics that are more in a way, oh, I won't say just qualitative, but um, you know, we, we have this race thing in this country uh, and race dictates an awful lot uh, of uh, where I see in my, my Valparaiso community, I'm a, I'm a city councilman, um, if, if black as they come, <laughs> And I've been elected twice by the largest plurality, um, by predominantly white voters. But nevertheless, I'm going to say that um, I've had concerns about the, the the huge number of people in a similar socioeconomic as what might you, you might find with uh, predominantly black communities, if you will, um, higher concentrations of working class, lower working class type folks. They they tend to vote against. Uh, their interests. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's an interesting dynamic where competitiveness is important. Um, but how does that occur? That's kind of my question. You know, it, does that integrate socioeconomic and race? I mean, that that's that's kind of that's got to be critical because until people can, in my example, you know, be a black guy in a place that's uh, sort of an incredulous uh, circumstance to be represented in, as strong as I am in my council district. I think that there could be more of things that are healed, not that we're trying to heal everything, you know, social problems, race problems, and things of that sort. Uh, but that, your earlier example talked about the different, uh, you know, segments within that one community that had, um, you know, predominantly black school, predominantly white school, one diverse school, whatever the case may be. I guess I'm trying to say is that w when, when you talk about competitiveness, how much uh, leeway do you have? I mean, I'm less concerned about contiguity, and, but that's important. You know, um, I'm less concerned about, you know, not, uh, you know, drawing someone out of their existing district. I want them to be competitive because in that competitiveness, you draw our, common, our commonness back into focus as it relates to the population, the broader, fully textured um, citizenry. And, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that a, a very clear understanding as to what you mean by creating a map that's inclusive, or I mean, in, in a competitive sense. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind if that snaked all around to get us out of some of this identity crisis where we have a virtual, you know, um, association um, with certain things that 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 many people who are afraid of the wrong thing, vote against their own interest. Um, again, like I say, we have to stop having these non-election elections, super majorities picking their own voters. If competitiveness is the factor, help me understand how that touches on all those other variables, you know, race, socioeconomic, um, and again, that, and again, so, uh, so that I can better determine which my higher priority will be. Okay. Robert, you raise um, a really, really interesting question. And, um, you know, I will just weigh in personally, but then I'm also going to have Julia weigh in on this. But, but um, I know that I ran as a Republican in Hamilton County. And the whole time I lived there, I was just flabbergasted that there was never a competitive um, race outside of the primaries. And so that's the kind of thing that we want to try to address as best we can. But I will agree with you that I think it's one of the most difficult problems to address. Uh, Julia. Yeah, before I go, okay, I'm glad you're gonna talk Julia, but I have history with Julia. She came and helped me uh, pass a, a resolution asking my entire initially reluctant Republican city council to endorse uh, her efforts. And I'm so happy that you came and it's still one of the highest points uh, for me uh, to have that logic. And I was delighted for the good government Republican. I think somebody introduced himself as that, you know, uh, that there is a bipartisan uh, uh, effort here that needs to, to be recognized for its um, salience. I'm sorry, Julia, but thank you again for that 2017, 18, whenever it was, visit developer. 
Well, thank you, Robert. I'm delighted you were able to join us. And I did want to recognize you as one of the leaders. Um, I think you were the first uh, Republican controlled council that passed a resolution in support of redistricting reform. We ended up with 33, uh, but Robert got his through very early on in the process. So I'm very uh, grateful and it's always good to hear from you. I would also mention, Robert, that I've got a new job for you. You know, the Bloomington City Council passed a ordinance creating a citizens redistricting commission to do their local redistricting. So I would like to talk to you about maybe putting something like that uh, in the hopper for Valparaiso. Uh, but, you know, your comments are, are right. Um, you have to decide uh, which uh, criteria is going to be the most important, and that absolutely will impact the maps that are drawn. And so if we decide that competition is the most important factor, and you know we keep hearing strong public support of that, um, compactness will be impacted. And you mentioned those districts that snake around. I mean, that is a trade-off. Um, and that is the challenge of redistricting. How do you create maps that are fair uh, and you cannot do it so that they equally fulfill all of the criteria? Um, you know, compactness has to fall to competition or competition has to fall to compactness, uh, but it is, it is impossible uh, to draw maps that would be, you know, equally compact and competitive. So that's the point of our conversation is to take the pulse of Hoosiers and see what they think is most important. Now, you know, the maps that were drawn in 2011, uh, if you hear Republicans talk about them, they emphasize how compact the districts are. Um, now, I, I think we could argue about, you know, are they really compact, but, but clearly that was, was what they wanted to emphasize. And so clearly competitiveness has suffered. Um, so again, the point of this conversation is to see what voters want and then very clearly transmit that message to the folks who will draw the districts this year. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Robert, for participating. Uh, next, I would call on Rebecca Chambers. Rebecca, are you still with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this conversation. I live in Hobart, and I'm also a member of the Indiana Poor People's Campaign. Uh, which is very concerned about all of the February 18th stuff that happened in the legislature. I think it's not unrelated to the problems that we have in our redistricting issues. Um, I will say that I was pleased to hear about, from Barbara about the NAACP and what they are trying to do to protest that particular juvenile and racist behavior in our legislature. I think that maybe is part of the problem when you've got a super majority. <laughs> um, but uh, the Indiana Poor People's Campaign is going to be protesting outside the um, courthouse in Indianapolis this week, uh, demanding that there be something done about that particular incident and that um, redress be given to those who were insulted. So I would just say that there are groups in this state who are very, very involved. The NAACP, the, the League of Women Voters, the Indiana Poor People's Campaign. We have a lot of really good groups and uh, there are more than a thousand different ways to participate. So, and this is one of them. So I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and the opportunity to hear what you all have to say. Thank you. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here and uh, for uh, participating in the forum. We welcome all of your uh, comments. Thank, thank you very you. much. Um, I would next call on Kevin Kempf. Kevin, I think you uh, participated earlier. Apparently, you have some more uh, testimony you would like to offer us. Yes, I would. Um, I know Christopher said it best as, as far as you know, when we're, when we're mapping this out, we need 
competitiveness between, it doesn't matter Democratic, Republican, but we need the competitive. And then we need, you know, to really, for the people themselves to watch out who they're electing as well. Um, because we have so many that are in elected offices currently, they're only hearing the majority of their district. It seems like a lot of them are closed ears to the minority of their district. So we need to figure out a way between the competitive to make the, you know, the minority and majority kind of come together and, and have one voice heard and not just one of them. Yes, I think uh, all legislators need to realize they represent everyone in their district and not be afraid to listen to people that aren't necessarily part of the majority in that area. So that's very important and uh, kind of weighs in on, uh, you know, the election process from the standpoint of, of trying to sort that out when you're electing someone, whether they're open to that or not. So um, thank you very much for those comments, Kevin. Um, I, yes, I'd next call on Bernadette Slowinski. Hi, I'm Bernadette. I live in Ogden Dunes and I'm newly elected to the town council. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who don't know, Lake uh, Ogden Dunes is a small community on Lake Michigan, uh, just north of Portage and just uh, east of Gary and Michigan City, Chesterton in that area. Um, and I'm very familiar. I'm from Northwest Indiana my entire life. I went to Wallace High School, went to IUN Northwest, adjunct faculty there. I still serve on two boards at IU Northwest. So I'm, I'm kind of one of those persons that looks at the holistic. And as somebody who's lived here my entire life, you know, I felt that we were the stepchild to the state of Indiana. And anybody that's in my age group would understand that. I have grandchildren older than some of the people sitting up here right now. I'm glad to see all of you. And I also want to um, commend you for having such a, a diverse group in, here right now. All ages, all races, all sexes, which is very good. But what I want to look at is in Northwest Indiana, we're still fighting amongst ourselves for what each piece of the pie is. And unfortunately, we're one region and we're very much, we're not just the south part of Lake and Porter County or the north part of Lake and Porter County. We still have the still industry and still related businesses, but we have a lot of great real estate sitting in Gary empty. And, you know, I'm one of those persons that remembers when it was a very booming city, but we have transportation systems that go right to Chicago. We're got the double track system that's going in shortly. Uh, Ogden Dunes and is one of the stops along there, but you've got all of Gary. There's a lot of talent here. We have IU, we have Purdue, we have Valpo in the South, we have Ivy Tech. And what's happening are all of our graduates staying here. We are finding that regional campus students tend to stay here more than those that may go to uh, Lafayette or Bloomington, but we need to tap into that talent and use the real estate. My little community only has 1,100 people, um, but because of our prime real estate being close to the Chicago, the railroad tracks, all of the homes that are selling people that are many of people my age of retiring or moving into condos or retirement living, almost every person, I would have to say 90% of the new residents are from Chicago. So we're looking at a very different population. I believe when you go to Miller, many of the new residents moving into Miller, which is part of Gary, also are from Chicago that we are attracting a lot of people that are highly educated who will, part, will prefer not to drive to Chicago to go to good restaurants. They would like to have places to go in this area. And we need to look at the state, look at Northwest Indiana more as a whole, as a part, of, as opposed to just one old section. The problem is I also remember when we would go down to Bloomington and you'd stop at Indianapolis. And the joke was, as you flow over Indianapolis, everybody go to sleep because they called it Sleepy Town or Nap Town. Well, we've put up, the state has put a lot of money into Indianapolis. And I, as a special educator, when I would go down for my conferences every year, we finally had a lot to do. There were good restaurants, nice hotels, plenty to do. But none of that money has come back into Northwest Indiana. And I feel that the taxes are not coming back here. I live next door to my local state senator. So I have ongoing updates from her what's going on. Um, 
gets very frustrated though, it's a Republican controlled Senate, no offense to you Republicans, but um, money's not coming our way. And I think we have different priorities. As a newly elected town councilman, we've been here, every new member, all of us are Democrats, and we're being the very conservative group trying to bring our budget back together. I think we, we're trying to work as a team. And what I'm seeing is the redistricting, that we find a way that we're not just all Democrat or all Republican. I know once we get down to the rest of the state, it does seem to change, but I'm involved in a lot of other sites. And I'm seeing that there's a lot more people who are not happy the way some things have been going um, in the state and across the country. And a lot of women are kind of standing up and saying, we want something different. So I, we just need the district to be able to impact all of us, not make it a racial divide, but more of, or an ethnic divide or a sexist divide, but how do we make each community more economically viable? You know, uh, what can we do to improve the schools? I'm very frustrated with the state, not giving much to teachers and educators as somebody who was in education my entire life. Um, and teaching at the university, not many people want to go there. They can make a lot more money uh, doing something else instead of spending four to five years in tuition and not being able to move along. Indiana, our former governor and vice president, did a lot to really freeze teacher salaries in Indiana. And unfortunately, it's not gotten much better since he left. Um, so I, I'm looking for more unity, uh, looking at what we can do to make Northwest Indiana a strong community. We no longer have the, um, the, the uh, Radisson Hotel. And I know a little, one of my neighbors is very much involved with that and talked about they weren't really making any money there. So we don't have anything to attract, but I think we need to look at Indiana, Illinois' loss is coming here. Our property values in Northwest Indiana across the region are going up. People in real estate, can't even find enough homes to sell. There's that much of an interest. And I think the state as a whole needs to really look at, we've got another boom coming back here and how do we make all the areas stronger? We might need a little more money. We've got to change our image, more, maybe more money for policing, uh, community policing. My town marshal is, you know, it's like, we're well, we're a small community, but it's like, it's we've got to be friendly. I kind of like, be strong when you need to be strong, but be officer friendly when you need to be officer friendly, uh, a balance, but we still need strong policing. I think people are afraid of the region. We do have some issues and we need to clean up that, it, clean those issues up. But what can we do? More high tech business. Every day I read in the paper of some new business going into Gary, I applaud. When I see new businesses going into the Ameriplexes in Hobart and in Portage, I applaud. All that means more for this area and for all the citizens that are living in Northwest Indiana, which includes LaPorte County. Um, I especially think of the three Northern, but I know it also includes Jasper and Newton County, but how we can work as a team. Yeah, Bernadette, it sounds to me like you, um, you know, um, although things have been going down in your area for a while, it sounds like there is great potential that is still in your area and you don't wanna lose the momentum and so you need to have a legislator that's gonna to listen to that. And um, so uh, certainly we can appreciate the fact that you have those changing demographics that you want to make sure and promote for your area. I think that Chris want, wanted to be able to speak to some of the things you've said. Hey Bernadette. Hi Chris. Hey, so you, you, you brought up some interesting points more so about regionalism. Um, so, so one thing I guess I was you know, maybe throw that out there and, and maybe get your thoughts. Um, how do you feel about how the current uh, Senate and House congressional district, I'm sorry, the, the current state Senate and House districts are drawn? Like, for example, you know, would, would Porter County be open to, you know, maybe a Senate or a House district, you know, stretching out from Lake County into Porter County, maybe incorporating Portage and Ogden Dunes, uh, because maybe we're more similar, especially in the Miller area, uh, Lake Station, you know, Portage, uh, Ogden Dunes and whatnot, that, that little corner uh, between uh, Lake and Porter counties, you know, have a lot of similarities. You know, would you be open in the context of regionalism when we're talking about, you know, playing up our strengths? Uh, right now, the boundaries are solely, you know, split with our Senate and House districts 
in the northern county in, in the northern sections of Lake County and Porter County, you know, it's like a hard divide where, you know, Porter County's districts, House districts and Senate districts only involve Porter County communities. Uh, but then when you get further south in the rural areas, then those kind of merge and include like rural Lake and rural Porter counties, you know, would you be open to uh, the I northern? Think it, I think it, well, my next door neighbor is a state senator. And I think in the last congressional changes uh, or the state, the changes, I think she did have part of Hobart at one point. I don't know. If she, I know she and Charlie Brown worked together, but I think Charlie was always, always there. But I think it changed. And right now, she has part of Michigan City, part of Port Chesterton, Portage, Ogden Dunes, but she has a little bit in Michigan City. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there would be an issue with that. Um, I know just from Ogden Dunes was always considered a Republican community, but the last two elections, we've gone sixty percent Democratic. I think we went more democratic than Portage did, which was quite surprising. Um, I was really surprised, I think, and my friends in Portage were quite surprised. But um, I, again, I think it's that Chicago influence. We're mm -hmm. looking at things a little bit more, diff a little differently. Mm -hmm. And we also have Lake Michigan in common, which is a great resource, which I, uh, for tourism. And we also have the National Lake Shore right here. So I don't think that that would be an issue. I don't know if Karen is on today. I see her car. She's next door, but I don't. Um, I know she's represented parts of Lake County in the past. So I don't know how they've made those changes. But I, I think the re region is still the region and it needs to, anybody that's anywhere in the region should be able to ref, uh, reflect the needs of the entire area. Uh, Bernadette, thank you so much for your comments. You obviously have a great knowledge of uh, your area and what's impacting it. And we so appreciate your testimony today. Um, I'm gonna call on Barbara Domer at this time. Um, Barbara, are you still there? Yes, I am. Hi, I'm everyone. Um, I'm a Democrat in Porter County and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Porter County. And I really feel like um, my voice at the statewide level is definitely not heard. So when I rate the three criteria, it's competitiveness, incumbent blind, and then compactness, because we have to end the supermajority. It's really ridiculous that um, a Democrat doesn't even have to attend a legislative session and <laughs> bills and laws and things get passed. And you know that's what I'm saying by myself being a Democrat, my voice is not heard. And that really has to change. So I really, I wanted to uh, kind of follow up on Robert Cotton's comments because it's interesting, like um, in order to be competitive, like I, I wanna stop hearing to give up Lake County and Marion County to the Democrats. We have to stop that thinking. <laughs> so if it means making unusual uh like drawing unusual districts <laughs> that look funny um if that means bringing some rural and urban people together to make that district more competitive then i'm all for that i'm all for it because right now it's clearly not working and i want my voice to be heard i want my voice to be heard um, and then just one other comment, I think the, um, for the congressional districts, I, I really do believe that Lake Michigan shoreline should always remain in one congressional district. And that, that's just my own personal opinion. So anyway, thank you all so much. I appreciate this and um, thank you for letting me speak. Hey, Barbara, thank you so much for joining us today and um, being willing to give us this additional testimony to help fortify our knowledge about the area and why, what might best serve it uh, in the mapping process. Um, I'd now call on Michael Puente. And Michael, before you start talking, I am going to let the audience know that you're the last one with your hand up at this point in time. So if anyone else, we still have 15 minutes to go. If anyone else uh, has some testimony to offer, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Michael, please go ahead. 
All right, thank you. I'm calling. I'm actually a reporter with WBEZ Radio. I cover Northwest Indiana for our station, NPR. We're based in Chicago. Um, I had a couple of questions. One, um, is there a any kind of um, thought or worrisome that, I mean, if you look at the congressional map now, it looks like uh, the first congressional district in, in terms of size is by far the smallest. It only encompasses Lake and Porter and part of LaPorte County, um, it appears. Um, is there some worrisome that perhaps um, part of the first district could, uh, uh, part of the fourth district and the second district could take up other portions of the existing first congressional district? And is there any kind of early sort of indication or sort of intel as to what the Republicans are hoping to do? I mean, any early signs of, a, of what their sort of desires for a newly drawn map would might include in Indiana? I think, uh, Michael, that the general consensus is, um, I don't think anyone has put pen to paper as far, far as, and that's kind of an old fashioned way of saying it, um, probably turned on their computer is a better term and started putting maps together too much um, because we don't have that census information available to us. So uh, no, I mean, other than the fact that the Republicans still have a super majority that I'm sure they're going to want to protect, particularly as evidenced by their intent to um, repeal the portion, the statute that requires um, the uh, process to go to an independent con uh, commission if it goes beyond April 29th. Uh, so uh, we can kind of interpret that as sign signaling the direction they will want to go. Um, and with reference to your first question, uh, since I'm not a part of that district, I don't know if Chris or Missy has any information as far as um, projecting where the other areas that this district might uh, go into or if they want to respond to that part at this time. Uh, right now, we're just gathering information. So, uh, Chris, did you want to say anything to that? Sure, Sonia. Um, so, Michael, right now, because we don't have the census data, for 2020 just yet, you know, this is, we're trying to make the most educated guess, but based on uh, the current census estimates, the 2019 census estimates, uh, it's possible that our congressional district did lose population. Uh, I think maybe more so in recent years, uh, that population loss has slowed down um, and could possibly, you know, be turning upwards uh, recently with a lot of uh, immigration from Illinois. Uh, but overall, in the, in the decade between 2010 and 2020, it's projected that we could lose some population. And because of that, you know, that our, our congressional district might need to expand, um, you know, and where it expands, that's we want public input from, from you and from everyone here, um, you know, in this hearing. Uh, now, granted, I mean, uh, back in 2000, uh, Congressional District 1 included uh, Newton and Jasper County in the past. Um, so that might, you know, uh, come back again. I mean, it, in, in geographical, in a geographical sense, it kind of makes sense because they're part of the, the greater metropolitan area and they're also in the central time zone uh, as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, you know, it's possible that the size of our Congressional District might uh, might increase, but that's what we, that's why we're hosting this public forum is to get your input and get the, get the, the, the citizens input um, and where we think would be fair to not mar marginalize anyone and also make sure that we have competitive districts. Thank you. Yeah, do uh, we, sorry, do, do we, I'm sorry, just what, my last question. Do you know when this has to be approved by the uh, state legislature? A lot is going to be dependent upon, you know, us getting the information. And since that won't be in until uh, September 30th and the legislature uh -huh. hasn't telegraphed those dates yet, uh, we don't really know. Julia, do you have any response to that? Yeah, unlike Illinois, we don't have any sort of statutory or constitutional deadline other than what was mentioned previously, the congressional districts. Uh, if they're not done by the 29th, go to a backup commission, but that's being repealed. The only real deadline are candidate filing deadlines. And of course, you know, we don't have any elections here in 2021, so that's 2022. 
Um, so I expect the General Assembly will want to get this done as expeditiously as possible once they get census data, uh, but we know they won't have that until September 30th. So we are expecting a special session just for redistricting some point this fall. All right, thank you. Thank you. And Michael, thank you very much for tuning in to our forum. And I would now call on Deborah Chubb. Deborah, are you Hi. there? Hi. We can hear you now. Great. So, um, and I'd asked that uh, I did the written um, questions um, and got uh, some answers, but um, I guess my, my point is that if we are going to see, um, you know, so we're up here in District 1, which is kind of a uh, reliably Democrat, so it's gerrymandered Democrat up here, and, um, and, and that will change probably, um, but, um, you know, so if we say, you know, we're going to have more competitive districts, um, I guess my point was, how can we ensure that all districts are competitive? And, um, and it sounds like that's a bit of a problem to really you know, make sure all districts are competitive. Uh, to me, that seems like the priority, um, just so that everybody would have a shot in every district. Um, but, uh, but then I uh, wonder, you know, is there a range of competitiveness, like success of competitiveness? Like, so, you know, can, can we ensure that all districts are, you know, have between maybe 40 and 60% of one party or the other. Um, if we can't say 50% in every, in every district. So, um, so I, I just wanna put that out there as, you know, as an idea. Um, and then when someone mentioned that the uh, Lake Michigan should be um, represented by one uh, representative, I thought, wow, I think I would like the opposite. I think, you know, uh, when we have these great natural resources that people appreciate, it would be nice if we had more representatives um, who, um, who, who had some of those natural resources in their district. And so there is Lake Michigan, of course. And then of course there's, you know, the big um, state forests in the South and, you know, some river areas. And so I don't know if that, if that can be translated into some sort of criteria for redistricting or not, but I would certainly like the, you know, those natural resources to be split into as many districts as possible <laughs> so that we would have as many representatives with, you know, with a part of those natural resources in their districts. Okay, Deborah, thank you very much. Um, I think Julia would like to respond to some of the points you've brought up. Yeah, Deb, let me just define um, competitive because if you define it as 60-40, then yeah, we probably could draw um, all districts that were, uh, they would be some sprawlers, but you could probably get to 60-40. I don't think people really consider 60-40 to be competitive. I mean, in political mm -hmm. terms, you know, you get anywhere above a district of 55, 56, it becomes a pretty high mount mountain to climb. But I did just mm -hmm. clarify, you know, if, if you're not talking anywhere near 50-50, um, I think in most parts of our state, you could draw a 60-40 map. There might be some um, counties where that would be a challenge, but um, it, it depends on what your definition of competitive is. Can I ask what is the, you know, what's the definition now? Well, you got to look at, I, I mean, there, you know, 50-50 would be ultimate. Um, I, again, I think in most uh, political campaigns, if you start looking at a 55, 56% um, district, it, it's very, very much uphill. Oh, wow. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, thank sure. you very much, Deborah, um, for weighing in. And now I would call on Lou Donkel. Becky, is Lou? Yep, it still looks like I am not available. I'm not able to um, unmute because you're using an older version of Zoom. Um, is the is the error it's giving me? So Lou, if you um, you can also put your your thoughts into the chat box. I'm really sorry about that, but um, saying that I am not able to allow you to talk because your your Zoom might be a little bit out of date. All right. Well, Lou, we hope that you will find a way to get your comments uh, to us. 
Uh, they are very important. Um, we have one other individual who has raised his hand, and this is Mr. Cotton again. Uh, Mr. Cotton, would you like to talk to us again? Just real quick, it's more of a question with respect to COVID and the census taking as to how uh, thorough or um, how adverse that may have been, as well as, um, you know, someone's comments about there's, it seems to be a lot, a lot of focus on the first congressional district. I think that anything that does change can't be uh, dilutive of the only, of one of the only democratic strongholds. If in fact, uh, there, if, if that's diluted, brought to any uh, additional measure of um, competitiveness, you know, that has to be universal, um, where there's going to be the uh, reciprocal happening by whatever means necessary. And some of these places that bring us these guys, <laughs> well, they, they, you know, it's competitive reciprocally. So anyway, uh, I, so those two things, I, mean, I just questions more than anything. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again, Robert. We appreciate those um, comments. Um, and Mr. Donkel, do we have you back? Um, nope, I would suggest, uh, Mr. Donkel, if you could just sending in your, um, your testimony either via email and then uh, try uh, upgrading your Zoom later if you can. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, but at the moment, it looks like we're having some issues. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, Becky, thank you. Um, and I, I heard from Mr. Cotton and now we have Deborah Chubb, I think, who is back. Deborah, did you have an additional comment or question? I do. I um, on, this, on the issue again of competitiveness, is there a place where we can go to see um, what that percentage of competitiveness is in the, you know, in the current districts. I mean, I assume this is based right on historic, you know, historically voting Republicans against, you know, historically reported uh, uh, voting Republicans. So yeah, is there a place to find that information? Well, the secret not compiled like district by district, you know, by a certain breakdown, you could certainly go to the Secretary of State's office and, you know, see um, what each state Senate, state house and congressional district, um, you know, election results were. Um, you can, there's a great website uh, called scoreplans.org uh, that will show you the degree of gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering, and it goes back over four decades. Um, so that's, but it, it's not gonna give you the partisan divide of each district, but you know, if you wanted to do that, you could certainly uh, find that information via the Secretary of State's election results. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right, Deborah. Thank you for those those excellent questions. And um, we are very close to nearing the end of our forum. Um, there are no questions um, waiting in the queue at this point in time. So I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for participating in our third forum. Please um, come back again if you didn't get enough uh, to one of our other six forums, um, but uh, also encourage friends and family uh, to participate in the forums because the more information we get, the better the maps are going to be. So we would like to have as many people participating as possible. Um, uh, does anyone else have anything they would like to say? If I could just touch bases with Robert really, really quick about the census data and how we gathered it this season. Um, in answers to your question, I believe that we did a very, very comprehensive job, especially here in the state of Indiana. I had the privilege of doing it here and also enumerating in another state. And just the response that I got from when we did knock on doors with the residents here, we got a lot of people who um registered and didn't get a chance to do it on oh, we've lost your audio again missy you've frozen up uh chip did you have anything that you wanted to say in closing um yeah i guess in in response to the idea of looking at at different scenarios now the website 538, they have an atlas of redistricting and I put the link in the chat. 
and it lets you look at uh, you know individual states like Indiana and show what you know maps drawn kind of by an algorithm that are drawn to be competitive, drawn to maximize uh, majority minority districts, um, drawn to gerrymander in favor of one party or the other, and it it of course it, it's using the older census data, but it it does kind of give you a sense of. Um, you know what might have been what what might have been possible under different scenarios 10, 10, 10 years ago if that that gives you an idea um, of what maps might look like in the future. Chip, thank you for that very much. That just shows everyone uh, the width of information that we have on this panel. And um, yes, we do need to have that information shared. And I think it has been put into the chat. So anyone have anything else? Just a salute to everybody who participated. I think this has just been great. And it's exactly the kind of input that we need. I have to agree. This was, this is a very interesting one between listening and reading the comments on the chat. I was like, this was really good. Yeah, it's not surprised. Different. It's my district. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, another successful forum concluded. And I thank everyone for your participation. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Becky. We'll sign off. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys, I think, Wednesday. <laughs>